Today on Know the Truth, Philip DeCourcy shares the beauty and power of the gospel. What we have in the biblical record isn't an embellishment, isn't the fabrication, isn't the lie. The reality of the four gospels, we have four beautiful portraits of the glorious Son of God. And if we'll take them to heart, they'll beautify our lives. In our world today, there are plenty of urban legends, and now with the internet, we can quickly and easily check the facts about any story we hear. On today's edition of Know the Truth, Philip DeCourcy describes the rigorous fact-checking of the New Testament, and he lays out the time-tested truth about the individual Gospels, describing why Christianity is a historical religion rooted in verifiable facts. If you missed the first part of this message, you'll find it online at ktt.org. Here's Philip with his message, It's the Gospel Truth. Let's turn to Mark's Gospel as we return to a series entitled The Essential Jesus. We're going to work our way through this shortest of all the Gospels, one that's written to capture our interest and imagination regarding the Lord Jesus Christ. We have an essential Gospel that outlines for us the essential Jesus who's essential for you. I want to help you understand the fact that what we have in Mark's gospel is a true and trustworthy record and account of the Lord Jesus' life, death, resurrection, and ministry, and why it's all important for you. First of all, those nearest to the events of Jesus' life penned the four gospels with which the New Testament begins. John Mark wrote his gospel, from first-hand recollections of Peter. There's nothing detached, nothing distant about the gospels as a record of Jesus' life and death. It's not like men wrote the gospels 300 years or 400 years after the event, which is often the case in antiquity when it comes to writing someone's life. Most of what we know about Alexander the Great was written some three to 400 years after his death. And no one questions the historicity of his life. But here we have four Gospels written by those who claim to be with Jesus for three years of his life, eyewitnesses to those accounts. And the first Gospel was probably written only 30 years after Jesus' death and during the lifetime of many who saw and heard him. That's one of the unique things about the Gospels. They were written early enough for to be read by people who witnessed the same events. So if you're trying to pass a fabrication as truth, I think there's going to be a gotcha moment somewhere in that generation. That It's only 30 years after Jesus' death, resurrection, and ascension that we have the first Gospel. In antiquity studies, That's very, very, almost uniquely close to the historical event. And that should give us a great confidence in the Gospels themselves. And then you can add to that the fact that the church fathers in those early centuries of church life, they reinforce the fact that the four Gospels are an accurate account of Jesus' life. Papias, Justin Martyr, Irenaeus, Clement of Alexandria, Tertullian, Eusebius, Jerome, they all indicate that the four Gospels are a true account. In fact, let's listen to Irenaeus, somewhere between A.D. 140 and the year 200. It is not possible that the Gospels can either more or fewer be in number than they are. For since there are four zones of the world in which we live and four principal winds, while the church is scattered throughout all the world and the pillar and ground of truth of the church is the gospel and the spirit of life, it is fitting that ye should have four pillars breathing out immortality on every side, encouraging men afresh. And therefore the gospels are in accord with those things among which Christ Jesus lived. Here's the other thing on top of that. We have multiple and accurate copies of the Gospels near the events themselves. 
In fact, one of our earliest fragments, one of our earliest manuscripts, which can be a record or a copy of the original gospel in any size, that dates to around about A.D. 115 to 130, only a few decades after the original gospel was written. It's a fragment of John's gospel. It's known as the John Raylands Papyrus. There are 5,800 Greek manuscripts copies either in partial form or full form of the New Testament, including the Gospels. If you add other languages to that, we have something like 20,000 manuscripts of the New Testament. You say, is that important? Yeah, it's wildly important. Let me quote Daniel Wallace of Dallas Theological Seminary. New Testament scholars face an embarrassment of riches compared to the data the classical Greek and Latin scholars have to contend with. The average classical author's library remains number no more than 20 copies. What they're saying, if they're dealing with an historical issue, they usually have no more than 20 copies of that issue. And that's kind of the benchmark. That's the accepted norm within the study of antiquity. Here's what he says. We have more than 1,000 times the manuscript data for the New Testament than we do for the average Greco-Roman author. Not only this, but the extant manuscripts of the average classical author are no earlier than 500 years after the time he wrote. For the New Testament, we are waiting mere decades for surviving copies. The very best classical author in terms of extant copies is Homer. Manuscripts of Homer number less than 2,400 compared to the New Testament manuscripts that are approximately 10 times that amount. Now, I don't want to get too technical, but you can get your head around that. Why should we believe the Gospels? Because those that wrote them, wrote them close to the events. And they were eyewitness to those events of which they wrote. And while we do not have the original manuscripts, we have multiple and accurate copies as close as 30 to 40 years in the case of that one manuscript with regards to John's gospel after the original was written. We have an abundance of manuscript evidence underscoring the New Testament's validity and historicity. Here's another thought here quickly. The gospels were written in a way that allows for them to be fact-checked. They were intended to be historical, You can see this in the introduction of Luke's gospel. In so much as many have taken in hand to set in order a narrative of the things which have been fulfilled among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and the ministers of the word delivered, it seemed good to me, having had all perfect understanding of all things, that from the first to write to you an orderly account, most excellent Theophilus, that you may know the certainty of these things in which you were instructed." Luke is telling you, I've done some good research, and I'm giving you a good record of the things that happened among us. The story of Jesus Christ is acted out upon the stage of history. In fact, in Acts 26, verse 26, the early apostles made this argument to the unbelieving world. None of this was done in a corner. We're an open book. The gospel story's an open book. Fact check it. Look at it. We have documented it. We're telling you who he was, what he came to do. The Bible puts its head on the chopping block, so to speak. The Bible writers give us enough historical rope with which to hang them if they're fraudulent. Because throughout the Gospels, there's 31 different historical characters mentioned, places, times, customs. And that's very important. Christianity is an historical religion rooted in verifiable facts. You read the Gnostic Gospels, that's mythical. That's not rooted in history. The Gospels are rooted in history, and you can fact check its dating, its places. Remember that story in John 5 where Jesus heals the man by the bathing pool? And in describing that scene, he talks about five pillars. And for years, archaeologists couldn't find those five pillars. And there was great doubt cast upon the historical record of John. Until recently, they found that pool and the five columns that are there. The Bible invites you to check it. Here's another argument, moving quickly, what I call the credibility argument. 
in continuing to make a good and growing case for the reliability and trustworthiness of the Gospels. I want to argue for their credibility based on internal and external evidence. First, we have the character of the witness accounts themselves. The writers are quite upfront regarding the fact that they want to give you and me a true witness account of what happened during that time of Jesus' life, death, burial, resurrection. In fact, in the Gospel of John, the words truth and related words, you'll find them 48 times. The word witness and related words like testify, you'll find 47 times. What's the Gospel of John all about? It's all about giving us a true witness to the life of Jesus Christ. The gospel writers are clear. Hey, we want you to know we are intending to give you a true account. They had been with him for three years. They had watched him teach, do the miracles that indeed they record. They were eyewitnesses. We read just one example of that would be 1 John 1 verse 1, where John, who wrote the gospel and wrote three epistles, tells us that he saw and handled the word of life. Peter, who's the source of Mark's gospel, according to our argument last week, well, according to 2 Peter 1, verse 16, verse 17, he says, hey, our gospel's not the product of cunning fables that we devise. No, we saw his majesty on the mountain. The gospels are not myths, not legends. They are firsthand accounts of the life, death, and resurrection of Christ. In fact, Norman Geisler, in a very helpful book on the New Testament, says this, the Gospels show every sign of authenticity. They are vivid, fresh, unembellished, detailed, self-incriminating, diverse, but mutually confirming in their accounts. Then he goes on to say this as an argument. The writers made no attempt to harmonize their accounts. They included material that put Jesus in a bad light. They left many difficult passages in their text. They retained many self-incriminating details. They included many demanding signs of Jesus. They distinguished their words from his. They did not deny their testimony under threat of death. They claimed the record was based on eyewitness accounts. They had women witnessing the resurrection before men. They challenged their readers to check out the facts. They discard long-held Jewish beliefs overnight, and they include some 30 historical characters in their accounts. He's given you a kind of prism, a paradigm by which to come to this and go, are these fabrications? I mean, if you're going to write a fabrication, something that's embellished, is that the kind of story you would write? And is that the way you would write it? Not likely. And then you have the outside sources confirming the record of the gospel. Jesus was no phantom. The gospel account is no fairy tale. You can go to Jewish and Roman sources, and indeed, if you read their writings, you'll be given an outline form of the gospel without ever opening your Bible. Roman authors like Tacitus, Suetonius, Pliny. Then in the Jewish world, you've got Josephus and writings within the Talmud itself. When you read those, you'll find out that Jesus' mother was named Mary. You'll find out that his conception was irregular. He was a renowned teacher. He acted in supernatural ways. His title was Messiah. He was executed he was proclaimed by his followers to be raised from the dead, and he was worshipped as God by those who belonged to the church. That's outside sources. There's nothing mythical or legendary about the accounts that we have in the Gospels. Here's the last one, what I call the credulity argument. The credulity argument. I want to argue, as I have, that the Gospels are a faithful rendition of Jesus' life. And I would argue that the alternative view requires more faith to be believed in than belief in the Gospels themselves. Erwin Lutzer, it strains credulity to accept the notion that the early apostles knew the historical Jesus as a mere man and then later chose to deify him and proclaim him as a unique son of God who performed miracles and rose from the dead. He says, you want to believe that? And Lutzer says, that strains credulity to believe that. And here's a couple of lines of argument. For the disciples to sit down knowing that Jesus was a mere man and then proclaim him as God, in the Jewish mind, you can't think of anything more extreme and blasphemous because 
There was no other God to be worshipped, according to Exodus 20, verse 3. Claims the deity in the Jewish community ended with your stoning to death. How do you explain a body of Jewish men trying to sell a lie about God come in the flesh? The only way you can explain it is that as they walked with him and talked with him and watched him, Jesus Christ proved himself to be such a man. God come in the flesh. Here's another line of argument. The gospel narrators invite us to look at their story. They're not trying to hide anything. They wrote near to the time. They were familiar with the events of Jesus' life. And so it's interesting in Acts 2, and in Acts 26, 25 to 27, that in the apostolic preaching, they even say to their contemporaries who were alive around the time of Jesus' death, hey, take a look at this. Didn't he say this? Did you not hear us tell you he said this and he did this? If it's a lie, if it's a fabrication, you've got enough critics at that time that they can prove that to be a lie. In fact, that's a whole other argument in itself. It usually takes about 200 years, according to the research that I've done, for a myth or for a legend to take root in a culture. These accounts are way too close to the events ever to be taken as a myth. If they are fanciful and fraudulent, they can be exposed within the generation that saw these things. Credulity strained. Here's the last thought. Think about the fact that the disciples had so little to gain and almost everything to lose by fabricating a story that supersizes the Jesus figure. What were they to gain from this fabrication, this embellishment that the Jesus seminar tells us it was? Did they gain financially? No. Did they gain in popularity? No, they were all martyred. It strains credulity. These were men of conviction. They saw, they heard, they beheld his glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And they went to fiery deaths, convinced of it. Hardly a fabrication, hardly an embellishment. In fact, listen to these words as we draw to a close from the historian Will Durant, who, by the way, is generally considered more of a skeptic than a believer. You know his massive work, The Story of Civilization? In fact, he has one volume on the life of Jesus, some 750 pages. Here's what he says. He admits there seems to be some stylistic differences between the Gospels, but then he says this. The contradictions are of minutia, not substance. In essentials, the synoptic gospels agree remarkably well and form a consistent portrait of Christ. No one reading these scenes can doubt the reality of the figure behind them. That a few simple men should in one generation have invented so powerful and appealing personality, so lofty an ethic, and so inspiring a vision of human brotherhood would be a miracle far more incredible than any recorded in the Gospels. You get his point? It's a great point to end on. Here's a secular, somewhat skeptic historian saying, you would have to strain credulity given the impact of the Jesus figure in human history. That a body of simple Judean men, fishermen, tax collectors, fabricated in their mind a set of ethics, a transcending figure that has captured the imagination of the world and changed the course of history. That would be a greater miracle than any miracle you've ever read in the Gospels. My friend, don't you be battered into submission by this aggressive culture that's throwing off its Judeo-Christian heritage, that's being molded by the secularists and the feminists and the liberals who control media and print and who are selling our young people and our people a lie about the truth. They're telling lies about the truth. And as we begin Mark's gospel, I want to say to us as a congregation, let's come week by week saying, Lord, change my life for eternity. Because what I'm about to read and what the pastor is about to preach is the story of all stories. 
that began in the heart of God in eternity and unfolded on a bloody cross on a hill called Calvary that shook the world because of a resurrection. And it's been changing lives ever since. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time in the Word. Strong meat to some degree. We've got to chew on this stuff. But we pray it would satisfy our souls. It would give our young people and new believers and doubting Thomases an encouragement to believe that what we have in the biblical record isn't an embellishment, isn't a fabrication, isn't a lie, isn't something that was decided in A.D. 325, but something that unfolded in the first century, copies of which can be found just decades after the events. And the reality of the four Gospels spoken about again and again across those couple of centuries by the church fathers realizing that we have four beautiful portraits of the glorious Son of God. And if we'll take them to heart, they'll beautify our lives. Give us a confidence in your word. Help us to be bold apologists and evangelists this week using the gospel of Mark to confront men with the story that will change their story. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We have the good news and it's meant to be shared. You're listening to Know the Truth with Philip DeCourcy. And if we're going to be effective in God's kingdom, it's vital we pray for God's boldness and provision. But Philip, it's also important that we equip ourselves with the truth and encourage one another in our unique spiritual giftings. That's an important point, Wayne. You know, God has uniquely created and gifted each of us according to his purposes. Ephesians 2 verse 10. We all make up the body of Christ. and We all have a vital part to play in it. And that's actually the subject of a new book I just wrote called You Go Girl. More often than we would like to admit, women have been limited and constrained in the exercise of their spiritual gifts and the fulfillment of their calling in Christ within the church. And my desire in this booklet is to examine and commend all that God calls women to be. In addition to being wives and mothers and homemakers, Single and married women alike have a valuable and essential role in building up the body of Christ. That's what I've tried to get across in the book. I've tried to strike a balance. As a complementarian, I challenge myself that often I express my complementarianism in the negative, what women can't do within the church, rather than the positive, what God has called them to do. And so this book, Let You Go, Girl, has sought to show the breadth and the beauty of of what God has called women to do um, under and alongside men within the life of the church. And I believe it will be a real encouragement and an empowerment to the women of our churches. Wayne, why don't you tell our listeners how they can request their own copy? Absolutely. To get in touch with your gift of any amount today, call 888-644-8811 or go to ktt.org. And whether you become a monthly Truth Ambassador or give a generous one-time gift, we'll send you Philip's brand new book, You Go, Girl. And as an extra thank you, we'll also send you the Love Is poster by Visual Theology. In 1 Corinthians 13, the Apostle Paul details the Christian character to the church and explains what it practically means to love as God loves. This subway-styled print displays a great reminder of how we can image the character of God to our families, friends, and neighbors. You can frame and display the Love Is poster in your home or office, or give it as a gift. And just ask for Philip's book, You Go Girl, when you give online at ktt.org, or call us at 888-644-8811. You can also mail your donation and request for the book when you write to Know the Truth, Post Office Box 30250, Anaheim Hills, California, 92809. Thanks so much for your generosity. When you give, you're helping deliver God's truth to men and women across the country and even around the world. Your investment makes a difference now and for eternity. I'm your host, Wayne Shepherd. Come back tomorrow as we continue to reflect on Christ's life and ministry in the Gospel of Mark. That's Tuesday on Know the Truth with Philip DeCourcy.
Today's program was produced and sponsored by Know the Truth Incorporated. Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free.